Today on Let's Talk Love, I had the pleasure of speaking with Kate Anthony, the host of the Divorce Survival Guide podcast and creator of the online coaching program, Should I Stay or Should I Go? Kate empowers women to find their strength, passion, and confidence, even in the most disempowering of circumstances, and helps them move forward with concrete plans set on a foundation, putting their children at the center, not in the middle of all their decisions. Our discussion today is about her Divorce Survival Kit, which offers tools for planning for and navigating through divorce in a loving, conscious, and caring way. For hopefully all involved, yourself, your ex, and especially your children if you have kids. Enjoy. We tackle the big questions, not shying away from the complex, the messy, the awkward, and the joyful parts of relationships. To Let's Talk Love. I'm Robin Ducharme, and I am so happy to have our guest today, Kate Anthony. Kate, I know you're in Los Angeles. <laughs> you said there's, you're, you're dealing with this big rainstorm, but, and I, um, Anyways, I'm just so happy to have you. I have been following your work for a long time and we have pointed people in your direction that are um, either contemplating or going through or have gone through a divorce. And I think that the work that you are doing um, is is very valuable and very important in the world because yeah, thank you. a lot of us have gone through or may go through a divorce. <laughs> I myself am a divorcee, but I am remarried. Um, and Good I wish I would have, I wish I would have, um, actually come upon your work years ago when I was going through a divorce. So I just think, um, anyways, I just want to just give you kudos for the amazing work you're doing in the world. And let's just dive into what it is that you do. <laughs> so can you tell Thank us, you. can you please tell us specifically how you become one of the world's experts in surviving through and thriving through <laughs> divorce? <laughs> <laughs> step one, <laughs> step one, go through a divorce. That's the step one. Um, and you know, really what one of my, one of my sweet spots is around making the decision to stay or go. Um, yes. and that is one of the things that I help women with. And, and, you know, part of the reason I do that is because, you know, when I was going through this, I was agonizing for years, for years <laughs> about whether I yes. should stay or go. Um, and I just, you know, I was looking for a burning bush. I was looking for something to very specifically say, go or stay, <laughs> you know? Yes, you're, um, you needed a sign, right? Because you were getting- I needed yeah. a sign. I needed a sign. And I kept, you know, I kept asking people, like, how do you know when, like, this is it? And they were basically like, when you know, you know you'll know. And I was like, that's not helpful. It's not and an answer. It's not really an answer, but- and I think there's a lot of truth to that. I think many of us get to the point where we're like, you get, I mean, I did. When I knew, I knew it was a moment. It was like a frying pan upside my head. And I was like, oh, I gotta go. Um, and part of that was because of my son. Part of that was um, what we're doing here is not the model that I want for yes. my child. Um, and then we you know, went through a fairly good divorce, you know, all things considered, it was a terrible marriage, but the divorce was okay. And what I've learned over the years, um, you know, by the way, how do you, how do you become, how do you do what I do? You know, step one is get a divorce. Step two is to get trained and certified in all the things. Um, of course. Because you can't just be a divorce coach because you've been through a divorce, right? Because then you only know your divorce. Um, so, um, you know, step two is, is, is go to school. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you know, over the years, I, I have also unfortunately become, um, an expert, um, and also certified in, um, uh, domestic violence and identifying, mm -hmm. uh, in particular emotional abuse and coercive control, um, narcissistic abuse, all of those things. Uh, which yes. I never set out to do, but the prevalence of it is, um, is astonishing. Absolutely. Uh, you know, um, so I help women identify those things and, and then, you know, make this terrible decision, um, and then, and then move through it. Yes. And I think uh, what you, with, what, yeah, I, I, I love the no. fact that you give people tools, right? That's what that, that's yes. what the Real Love Ready 
Um, that's what we aim to do is, I mean, we can, you know, I can, we can bring together the experts and give the information, but if you don't have practical, tangible, um, st- like, you know, sometimes you need step by step or even just like thinking about like, these are the things you have to really think about. For instance, if you're getting a divorce, like, the bigger picture here, and then these are the tools that right. you can implement. So absolutely. So, so absolutely. talking about the staying is like knowing to stay or go. Can we talk about, for instance, mm-hmm. something you ta- that you teach about is codependency. Yes. So how does someone figure out if they're codependent, if they're in their relationship? Like what would be some Um, signs that you are in a codependent situation? If you are a, um, a woman in 2023, you are probably codependent. I mean, it's, Mm -hmm. it's terrible to say, but most, I think so many more people are, and it's not, listen, you know, people are like, Oh God, that's awful. And I say, no, it's not. It's, it's great. It's great to identify this. You are not alone. This is so common. It is so yes. prevalent. It's, it's, you know, I often say that codependency is a symptom of living in a patriarchy. Women are, to- we are groomed to be codependent. We are groomed to put everyone else's needs before our own. We are groomed from, from childhood to be the nurturers and the caretakers and and to uh, subjugate ourselves and to, you know, ignore our own needs. And at the sort of core of it, those are the symptoms of codependence, right? Is that we put everyone else's needs ahead of our own. We don't really know who we are. We mm-hmm. don't really we don't know what our own needs are. I couldn't tell you what my favorite color was 20 years ago. Um, you know, what do you want to have for dinner? I don't know. What do you want? Wow. Yeah. Um, hmm. Right? Because we just don't, we don't think, oh, my, me, I have a self. You know, hmm. codependence, I think also at its core is that we have been um, not taught to uh to connect with our capital s self um and so that's sort of you know the broad strokes right i think that so and and i think most women suffer from this codependency also um pia melody wrote a brilliant book about codependency called um facing codependence um and she asserts, and I think she's absolutely right, that all codependency uh, has its roots in childhood trauma. Mm. So any um, abandonment, neglect, enmeshment, right? If you had a parent that was too involved and too controlling and didn't like, you know, this is my case where my mom was so controlling that I didn't have, there was no space for me to develop a self. Yes. Um, and then that creates codependency. And then out of that comes all sorts of addictions, um, you know, uh, chemical addictions, process addictions, anxiety disorders, like all of it. Um, but it all stems from this place of not having the safe container to create a sense of capital S self. Yes. And I know you do a coaching program, which we, I really want to go into, um, later mm-hmm. on. And you are, you're sure. teaching women how to identify and create. It's almost like you have to, you have to know what you need to, um, cultivate or understand about yeah. yourself and then yeah. growing into that. Right. So you, so you give yeah. people, give women the tools for that. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. And, you know, in my should I stay or should I go program, the very first thing we do is all the work on the self. Yes. Yes. Because I don't want the focus on the other person. No. Until this. Yes. Until this is sort of fertilized and nurtured. And because then when you have a really solid sense of self and you know who you are and you know what your likes and dislikes are and you know what you stand for in the world, whether the other person matches that, upholds that, um, fosters that in you, celebrates those things in you, uh, becomes very obvious. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, right? And that's what you want in a partnership. Yes. Oh, I really love that. 
So one yeah. of the things I know that you come across, and I think it's just so prevalent, is just people staying for the kids, right? Always. And yeah. Well, yes. So what do you say when people tell you they think they need to stay in an unhappy marriage for the sake of the kids? This notion that you'll be creating a broken home. I hate that term. Oh, yes. It's like, what the heck? It's, well, first of all, like, what <laughs> is the just... broken home? Is the, yeah, right? The bro, I mean, in my sense, in my world, if, if the home is already broken, <laughs> like, get Inside out. the home. So that you can, right? It's already broken. So that notion is just, it's terrible. It's an awful term. Um, the research, however, I can, you know, I can give you my opinions all day long, but the research has shown that divorce does not screw up kids. There are two things that screw up your kids. Yeah. Staying in a very toxic marriage. Yes. Um, or in a marriage in which it is clear that the two people are not happy. They don't like each other, right? At the end of the day, what whatever marriage you have is the one that your kids will end up replicating for themselves. You are your children's model for relationships. So yes. if you don't want the one that you have for your kids, then you should probably consider, you know, look either, either change the marriage. Um, but if that's not possible, then, then perhaps you might need to leave the marriage. Um, it's more complex than that, obviously, but that's, that is the, that is the bare bones truth. Um, the other thing that screws up kids is a bitter, nasty, toxic divorce that uses the children as pawns yes. in the oh. middle of their of the divorce process. Right. Yep. The things that do a healthy divorce in which both parents say, OK, that didn't work. Now we're going to create something better and and, you know, collaborative. Right. That's the best case scenario. However. Even if only one parent is the safe parent, is the safe place to land, doesn't have, right? You can be the only one. Um, and it only takes one. It only takes one parent to have your children, um, you know, grow up with a healthy, healthy sense of self, self-esteem, uh, all of those things. And, um, you know, a lot of people will say that they want to stay because they're trying to, they want to mitigate, right? They want to, he's, he's toxic or controlling. She's toxic or controlling, whatever it is. Um, they're a narcissist. They're abusive. If I stay, I can protect the kids. But what you're and actually you, oh, this doing is, this is, is condoning it. Yes, Kate. And mm -hmm. I think that you, you know, you say this, um, I've heard you say this so many times in different ways, but for instance, if your partner is abusing you, just by proxy, they're abusing the child. That's right. That's absolutely yeah. right. I hear people say all the time, he's a great dad, but he abuses me. He's, but he's a really good dad. He just cheats on me. He's not a good dad if he's abusing you. He's just not. There's no possible way for that to happen. Uh, my friend, uh, Dr. Christine Cocciola always says, um, that, uh, uh, that abuse, domestic violence and child abuse are not siloed. They are the same thing. So if you are being abused in your marriage, yes. your children are also being abused um, in the marriage. And they're witnessing it. They are, they yeah. are, all of that, all of that is affecting them. Uh -huh. yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and it's affecting their relationship mapping, their relationship yes. imprinting. Oh, goodness. That is, that is the truth. Yeah. And all you have to do probably is go back into your family history and go, how did I get here? Right. How did this, how, how did the relationship mapping that I experienced get me into this marriage? Yeah. Right. And so you, then you can see that like, well, then that's exactly what's going to happen for your children. So research has shown that children only need one safe home, even if it's only 50% of the time. They need mm. one place that they can go and that they know that they feel safe. They know, and you know, and being the safe parent comes with all sorts of things where the kids come home and they let it all out on you and you become the punching bag and all of that, right? And your job in that case is to just 
hold space for the kids and, you know, nurture them, be, be, be their therapist. They should ha also have a therapist, but your job in that moment is to really be the safe place for them. Yes. Um, and as long as they have that, they actually get, you're giving your children the gift of perspective. That if is, stay, that is so, so good, Kate. I love that you're giving your kids the gift of perspective. Yes. Right. They wouldn't have that if you were together. They wouldn't have it. No. Right. If you were, if they were in it all the time, it's the air that they breathe. They don't know the difference, but you provide something different and they're over there and they're like, that's so interesting. Over time, they go, Hmm, I feel this way in this house and I feel this way in this house. I definitely prefer feeling this way. And even if the courts and it's, this is a, you know, terrible thing and the injustice of the family law system that you know, you probably will have to share custody um, with an emotional abuser because the family law system does not recognize coercive control. It is only codified in five states as being a um, part of uh, in, in the definition of domestic violence. It is not wow. illegal in any of the 50 states. We're working really hard on that. Mm -hmm. um, but the but the point is that your children um eventually they will they will know the difference yes and you know when they come of age they may choose they're allowed to choose when they you know get to be a certain age they're yeah. allowed to say actually i feel more comfortable in this house this is where i'm going to stay yeah so we as a team because i um I'm a team that works on on Everything to do with Real Love Ready and Let's Talk Love. And we um, took your divorce survival kit. We purchased it because I really oh. wanted to see oh. what you are offering everybody. And um, it is so packed full of really, really incredible tools. And we don't have time to go through, yeah, through them all, but I just thought I would love to go through <gasps> some of them. Mm -hmm with you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, great. And cause, cause it, there was a lot of learnings there for me, of, even though I'm divorced. I'm just like, Oh yeah, exactly. I would have been like, well, that would have been a good one to follow. <laughs> Anyways. Right. Totally. So, yeah. Yeah. So, so what do you say is number, which is actually and one of the things I did do with my former husband is we did not hire an attorney right off the bat. And you say, don't do that. So don't why do, do you advise not to hire an attorney or lawyer right away? Well, like you might, because you might get advice. Yeah. You might get advice. Been the, but not I say hiring. have a consultation, yes. have a consultation with at least three attorneys. So listen, you want to know what your rights are. But the second you hire an attorney, you are now litigating, right? Like that's what that's what attorneys do. Um, if you if the goal is to mediate, then yes. put a pause on that. You want to have if you mediate, you want to have you must have a consulting attorney. Because a mediator does not tell you, you know, they're there to essentially mediate negotiations between two people. Their job is not to advise either one of you. So they're not going to come to the table and say, well, you know, you know, I, I suggest or I recommend or it would be fair to. That's not their job. So you want to have a consulting attorney on your side so that you actually know what the laws are. You want to know what you're mediating towards. Right. If you yes. have no idea what the laws in your state say you should be owed for child support or spousal support or you might have to pay. Right. You don't know what you're mediating towards. And you could come up with a number and both of you agree. And then like 10, you know, a couple of years later, you're like, wait a minute. I totally screwed myself. Right. You don't want yes, that. You need to be you need to be educated. You need to be empowered. Exactly. Exactly. So you want to have a consultation with an attorney, yes. but you don't want to hire one off the bat because you are making the biggest legal and financial decisions of your entire life in the middle of the biggest emotional upheaval of yes. your entire life. And that is a terrible combination. And you want to keep those as far away as possible. You want to process as much of the emotional fallout as, as you can in advance of making these legal and financial decisions. We at Real Love Ready are so excited to be hosting In Bloom, a love and relationship summit, April 14th and 15th, 2023 in Vancouver, BC. Join us for an insider pass to the most trusted relationship expertise, an intimate weekend of in-person or virtual learning, growth and community. 
We're bringing you the insights and tools you need to learn and bloom in your relationships. Head over to realloveready.com to learn more and get your tickets. We truly hope to see you there. I really like that idea about separating, like as much as you can, because like you said, it's the biggest, one of the biggest decisions you're ever going to make. And you, like the emotions are so tied in to all of the legal and the financial that you have to go through. And like, I mean, the separation of your kids and everything, it's just so much. Yeah. It's um, so much. And this like, is, I mean, let really, the dust this is settle. you need a coach or a therapist or just download your course. I mean, really, I think it's so important that you just have that other yeah. side, the emotional side, like tended to. Yes. Uh, I mean, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. You have got to let the dust settle. Look, and, and the, th- the thing is that the litigation system is designed to uh, be adversarial, that's that's the definition, right? And so when you get an attorney and they're like, okay, let's go, but you're still reeling from, mm. you know, the discovery of the affair or having been, you know, broken up with or like whatever it is, you are still emotionally reeling or they are, they're still in shock. They are, they didn't see it coming. They're blindsided. They're like, wait. And then you're like, okay, and here's a divorce paper and here's this and here's this, here's this. They're going to freak out as would anybody. Yes. So like, give it a minute, give it a minute. Don't even, and it's really hard, especially look, 69% about of divorces are initiated by women. There's a lot of reasons for that, but I didn't the realize the, that that was such a high stat. Yep. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're tired. Um, and we reach a breaking point and 25% of couples, of divorcing couples, only 25% have been in couples therapy. But usually the woman has been asking for decades, for years and years, I'm not happy, we need to go to therapy. I'm not going to therapy, you need to go to therapy, whatever. And then when we reach our breaking point and we say I'm done, um, then they then they wanna go to therapy, but it's too yes. late. It's too late it at that is. point. So You've already, if you've anyone already is ever decision. asking you to go to therapy, go. Um, so women are making this decision. Um, and again, men are, you know, often are blindsided by it. And women are like, he shouldn't be blindsided. I've been saying this forever. Yes, they are. They're blind for whatever reason, whether it's reasonable or not, they are. And if you start the process, they will hire, uh, a shark attorney. They, they will be they'll be mediating or litigating out of their rage and and hurt and nobody wants that that is the worst thing you can do it absolutely and not only for yourselves and but if you've got children the worst thing that could happen to your kids yeah because as soon as you go into court the people that suffer are the children yep yeah okay and so there's a lot in your um your survival kit about if you have children and i think this is so important that Yes, you're going through this, but obviously your kids like have to be the the top priority in this process. Mm-hmm. And so you talk about minimizing transition for the kids. Yes. So you've you've got some really good tools on um, what you me- recommend people do. Um, just you say, okay, just one thing you say is to start as you need to go on. Yeah. So yeah. what does this mean? Because I really <clears throat> like this, Kate, because there's some people that'll be like, okay, I'm going to do a, tr- okay, I'm going to go move into a hotel for yeah. or whatever, or go stay on someone's yeah. couch for a couple of yeah. weeks or a couple of months. And then I'll yeah. figure out my living arrangements as we're trying to juggle the kids, everything else. And you're like, no, no, no. That, yeah. I mean, obviously if there's abuse, then that's a different story. Right. There are, there are times when that may be necessary and that's totally fine. And I don't, and I don't have any judgment on that. No, no, no. Um, but you know, God love him. I think about a guy that I dated um, a, a few years ago, many years ago, um, and he had just gotten out of his marriage and he moved into a studio apartment and he had two small, a three and a five year old. <laughs> and I was like, what are you doing here? Right. And, yes. and like he got like a pull out couch and the kids were sleeping on that. And of course, oh. like that's not. That is not, and he was, you know, excited to live his bachelor life downtown LA, like all of this stuff, but like that was about him and that wasn't about his kids, right? And so he, you know, you want to think about that. You don't want to, like, like you said, like bring the kids into a hotel and then, oh, we'll figure it out. And then, uh, you right. If it's possible, most people, 
when they separate, end up having to live together for a while. Yes. Right? Whether it's financially, it, just decision making, right? I mean, I lived with my yes. ex-husband for six months yep. um, before I moved out because we weren't even sure who was going to move out. Well, um, you have to find our... a new place. I, we, we lived together, my former yeah. husband and I lived together for five months. I mean, because you can make mm -hmm. the decision, you tell, but it, it takes time. That's right. I've, I've, I had to find a house. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Right. And so rather than moving into a hotel or moving into an Airbnb or whatever, um, yeah, minimize the transitions, like get, get stuff sorted out behind the scenes, especially if your kids are young. If your kids are older, yes, they kind of are probably more aware of what's going on. But if you've got little kids, right, you're gonna, you're gonna get the place, you're gonna set up their room first, even if you don't have furniture in the rest of the house, you want to make a, as much of a home for them as possible. Um, and then you want to give them some agency, right? You're going to tell, you're going to have the conversation with them, which is also how to do that is in that, um, that kit that you're talking about. Um, and then you're going to, you know, you're going to ask, the, let them bring whatever they want to the new house. You're going to yes. like, they, they, wherever you can give the children agency, uh, is, is really an important thing. So they don't feel like everything is out of their control. Yes. And I, you know, something that I was, and I, and I worked with my former husband on this as well. I mean, we really did cooperate and tried, you know, it was all, it was about the kids, right? Yes. And that's right. it was like, okay, we're going to, um, number one, because my, I come from a divorced family and mm -hmm. in my experience, yep. my foundation and my brothers and I, our foundation was completely rocked. It was on, on a regular basis. My parents separated and got back together, separated, got back together until finally oh it was a divorce. But I mean, oh that in itself, like when you don't have your foundation, that's so important yeah. for children. And mm -hmm. so I said to um, my ex-partner, I was like, okay, the foundation's the most important thing. So I'm going to get a house. I'm going to set up their rooms. I did exactly what you are recommending. Yeah. Um, Good. Moved out while they were on a trip with their dad. Because mm -hmm. I didn't want them to be part of the moving process. But, you know, I left the, their our original home intact. I just took my yeah, very favorite right. things. Mm -hmm. You know, like I didn't want it yeah, to be too. like, oh, half yeah. the stuff is gone. You can't walk into a house and half their stuff is gone. Right. No, um, right. Exactly. But I did take some of their favorite books and like things that I thought, okay, just to make it feel like home. Mm -hmm. um, I just I just think it's really, that's just so very, very important. And the agency yeah. part, it was like, okay, if you don't love that, that I picked for you, then let's change this or <laughs> Totally. Putting the foundation, yeah. keeping the fa uh -huh. foundation intact. And mm -hmm. that has to do with the relationship you have with your former spouse. Whether it's, it, yeah. whether it's good, it has to do with actually the respect piece too. And just speaking kindly. You talk a lot about that too. Yeah. Well, and I think no. it also has to do with putting the, really putting the kids at the center of everything, right? No matter what yes. your relationship is, no matter yes. how like much you, like if you can agree to just put the kids at the center, not the middle, to make all decisions through the lens of what's best for your kids, then you're golden. Yes. But if, you know, but that's where people, you know, their their anger, their jealousy, their whatever, it's all about them and what they want. And then the kids get lost. And as you said, their foundation is just completely destroyed. Yeah. So this, if some of, um, we've got community questions and one of our community um, members is asking this question. With mm -hmm. two separate households, rules can be different. With different allowances in homes, it can create unhealthy dynamics between parents mm -hmm. and kids. Sometimes kids manipulate situations and sometimes adults control the outcomes. How do you best <laughs> recommend lessening the severity of these situations? Okay. Well, so living with different all, rules, different households, it's going to happen, right? It's going to happen. And, you know, my friend Christina McGee, who wrote the amazing book, Parenting Apart, um, Christina says, you know, kids are used to there being different rules in different households. They have, there are different rules in, in each classroom, right? She likens it to like a school mm. where as if, if the parents can agree on the overarching principle of parenting, which can also be very difficult, right? That you know that there is, again, a foundation of, um, you know, values. Um, yes. but you go to, to one classroom and the rules in that classroom are different from another, you know, Mrs. Johnson lets everyone sit on the floor and teaches in a more sort of progressive way when you're going to go to, you know, Mr. You know, Vasquez's room and it's going to be, you know, desks and chairs and right. And like, 
kids can make those transitions. Yes. That's okay. Um, I, I'm the idea that kids get different allowances in different houses. I mean, to me, allowance should be something that parents agree on. That should be something that, uh, because when one parent gives more than another parent, it, it, ca it can be a, a, a sort of a power play, yes. right? Um, and, you know, I think, in my opinion, allowance should be shared and it should be agreed upon. Um, my ex and I, you know, we always, uh, we got our son the green light card, which is a great tool. Um, oh. and you can each put, it's a, it's a debit card for kids and it teaches them about how to manage money and it, it, automatic savings and all sorts of stuff. And the parents can add money to it. Um, mm. and they can, they can have an allowance. They can tie it to chores that you can do whatever you want with it. But, um, but one of the things that we do is that every month my ex and I put the same amount of money onto our son's card. So if he's not with us, it doesn't matter. Like it was like, you know, trying to remember to have cash and to like give it to them on a certain day. Like it was a nightmare. Um, but once we got this, it was, you know, you can make it automatic. Um, and, and I think that's a, that's a much better tool, but there's different, there's other issues at play, um, when there are these power struggles. And so in that case, what you do is you talk to your kid about it and you say, I mean, you don't say like dad's using power, you know, power and control over mom, but you say, you know, dad has, has, has more money. There was a period of time when I was dead broke. I, you know, my son would be like, can we go to the movies? And I'd be like, no, we, we absolutely cannot. Um, I didn't have the money and supporting myself a solo, uh, you know, running a household by myself, trying to build this business. Like it was, it was a lot. My ex makes a shit ton of money. Mm -hmm. And there was a clear difference in our lifestyles and our abilities mm -hmm. to do things. And I just had to be honest about it. I would say, you know, honey, things that things are different in, you know, dad makes more money and, you know, I'm building something and someday <laughs> I, I, I hope, I promise we'll be able to do things. We'll be able to take vacations, go to the movies, eat out. But right now we can't. Um, and, you know, he learned that, that about life. Yes, <laughs> really? Yes. Right? Yes. Because some people have more than others and that's the deal. Um, and he learned about saving and he learned about like, you know, um, what it's like to be, um, to be frugal. Right? All of so, those lessons are just as All of those lessons, right. Yes. And, you know, I grew up in a similar circumstance. And so, I, and my mom, you know, my mom's favorite, not favorite, but you know, she would always say, well, we can't afford that. We can't afford that. We can't afford that. And I was very, and it, and it was very damaging to me that like, uh, it was a very strange way to say things. And the, the, the messaging was, was weird, <laughs> I'll say. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I was very careful ne never to say things like that. I mean, I would say, you know, we, we can't, we can't afford it if we can't afford it. Um, but it was never the like overarching theme yeah. of our life. If that makes sense. Yeah, it does. So Kate, you have something that you call the children's bill of rights <laughs> in divorce. <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh, I love this, but I just really would love for you to share with our audience about what is the children's bill of rights. Oh this is about gosh. agency. You know, right? I'd have to, this is about agency, right? And I, and I, I'd have to pull it up to see what I even put in there. I wrote that thing so long ago. Um, but it's really like what you're like, what are you, what is the scaffolding? or the foundation that you're building for your children. Your children have a right to be at the center of all of your mm -hmm. decisions. They have a right to not feel pulled in two directions. They have a right to have all of their belongings at b both houses, right? I don't even know, again, I don't know what's in there. I can't even remember, but it's the, but it is the general tone and tenor, right? Children deserve certain things that parents need to provide them. Yes. It's our job. And it's it's about safety and security yes, and protection. Is. Yes. Yeah. Right? I, I think about my children in this, in that the fact that ever since uh, my ex and I divorced, you know, that was 2016 and right now it's 23. So mm -hmm. seven years, week mm -hmm. by week, my kids, 
you know, they, they have their little bins. They still do. And yeah. they go back and forth, right? Every Monday. Yeah. And it's mm-hmm. a lot to ask them. It's a lot. It, it is, is so much. And I commend, you know, I, I commend the um, the bravery and just the strength that they've had. I mean, it's yeah. not like they, they have, I, I, I believe that that's just something that they have, they have, they have had to go through and it will make them stronger as, as adults are, you know, going through life. Um, but it's a lot to ask them. And so anything we can do as co-parents to make that transition and everything else and get, and get along and do everything with them in the top of mind, the best it'll yeah. be. Right. That's right. It's just that's really, right. really important. And listen, you know, there are times when it gets cumbersome. I mean, there, my, my son played electric guitar for a while and we, I mean, he still plays guitar, but yeah. he was, we were lugging amps and electric guitars <laughs> and acoustic wow, guitars yeah. like back and forth. And listen, like we live in Los Angeles, but my ex and I, we met and, 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 you know, our early life was in New York. I grew up in New York. God help us if that had been like a subway. <laughs> situation like it was a lot of shit oh Um, my gosh but we um but that's that's what we did you know yes and and i know situations where parents are like i'm not doing that it's like well who is that about who's that for exactly there was a time my son got really into fashion and he and he is into fashion right you know still but he um he now lives with me full-time he's 17 and he was like i'm done I'm done. Exactly. There, I'm sure there's gonna there's gonna come a time when my kids are yeah. like, we don't want to move anymore, which is I I, I just yeah, he's like really, I want I think, one place. I want one yes. home. I want one home base. I want one room. But before that happened, he was taking everything out of his closet and putting it in the back oh, of the car wow. and then yeah. picking it all up, all on the hangers and then putting it in his dad's and it was that was the that was like the heartbreak. Yes. It was that was very heartbreaking for me that he was like, yeah. I want all of my clothes. And you know, that was, that was towards it? the end. Yeah. That, that, that was is towards my 16 year old right now. She wants, cause they, and, and actually my 13 year old, because she wants to have all of her favorite clothes and all of her favorite clothes. Then they just, she doesn't have duplicates. Who has duplicates? Right. right? No, no, right. <laughs> like, of course. Exactly. When, when they're little, little, it doesn't matter. When they're little, no. they have pajamas here, pajamas there. That's fine. Yes. But you know, this is, um, and, and this is the point where, and by the way, when your kid finally says, I'm done, I don't want this anymore. Um, they may choose one place or the other. And I think that we have the obligation to To honor that. Honor that. And if it had been my, you know, if he had been like, I want to, I want to stay at dad's, then like, ouch. Um, but also, you know, okay, okay, this is not about me. This is about you. Yes. And then I have to figure out, okay, if he's not going to be in my space half of the week, how do I, how do I parent in this new paradigm? How right. do I still stay connected in this new right. paradigm? That is something that I would be very interested to hear, but we'll, we'll talk about it another time. <laughs> so, um, let's talk about this, Kate, separating yeah. money and building your own credit. How incredibly huh. important that is even during your marriage. Are you kidding me right now? I mean, yes, like even like during even, your marriage. Yes. Oh my gosh. And, and of course, after. You have like this is this is a certain this is a divorce survival kit, but I mean how important it is that, and I think so many women lose their credit, and yep. everything's joint. Why right. it doesn't have to be? Yeah. Yes, you can have a joint account, but I just don't understand. <clears throat> and if it is that way now, it's like you need to just create your own account and start building it now. That's right. If, if, That's right. Right. That's right. Yeah. If you are, yeah, if you're, you know, if everything, first of all, if everything is in your uh, spouse's name, that is a huge red flag um, of financial abuse. If your name isn't on every single account, um, every single marital joint account, then yes. um, you have almost no financial autonomy. And when you get, if you choose to leave, you're, you know, you, you're not going to, you may not have access um, even it, if like the legally, lease to your home, your car, yeah, your that's right, everything, your car, your car your is assets. very important. Yep, the car is very important, especially these days when you have cars that are uh, that have apps attached to them. And tr- and tr- so, you know, I had a client who had a Tesla, and it was in her husband's name only, and he was stalking her and abusing her, and and he could, tr- but the name, but since the, since the Tesla was only in his name. 
Only he had, she could not get him off of it to stop, awful. Tr- to stop stalking her. And I finally had her call uh, Tesla and, and escalate and say, this is a matter of domestic violence. And, you know, what are you doing with this new technology to protect victims? Yeah. Right. And they haven't. They haven't figured this out. She finally sold, she finally just sold the car. She was like, screw it. I'm kidding. I own Absolutely. Car. <laughs> right. But you know, she had the luxury of being able to do that. But, um, yes, financial autonomy is so important. Um, there's a wonderful book by a woman named Leslie Bennett's, um, who I adore and I had her on my podcast sometime last year. Um, and she wrote a book called The Feminine Mistake. Mm. And it is all about. Uh, women giving up and the feminine mistake is giving over uh, financial autonomy and independence that, you know, taking ourselves out of the workforce, um, making ourselves finance. And I did that. I was a stay at home mom. And um, but, you know, the the impact of that is so much uh, deeper than just I've been out of the workforce for a few years. The financial impact of that, and Leslie goes into it in the book, um, the statistics and, you know, all of that. Um, and it's devastating. So it's can devastating we talk about to women. That? Yes. Can I, I completely understand that. And I can see how that happens around. I've, I've seen it many times around me. Yeah. People I know. So what do you suggest? Because Keep if working. you are a stay at home mom and you're out of the mm-hmm. workforce and your spouse is 100% bread, the breadwinner and you're, you are the hundred percent house caregiver and Caretaker. child. Yes. Sure. Yeah. What do you suggest? Because it is, it, I mean, if you do end up in a divorce situation and you, you, you've been out of the workforce for 15, 20 years. Yeah. So do you it's suggest tough. that people get a part-time job or no? I mean, that's a hard one. It is a hard one. Um, I do, you know, there are different schools of thought on this. Um, yeah. from a legal and sort of financial, uh, position, if you're getting divorced, right, and you've been a stay at home mom, uh, a lot of people advise don't get a job until the divorce is settled so that it doesn't impact your settlement. Um, in my opinion, get a job. If it's going to impact your settlement and it's going to be offset by the money that you are making on your own, like, it's it's kind of probably gonna be somewhat balanced. Mm-hmm. So like have make the money. Please start making your own money. Have your own autonomy. Don't you know? Have your own sense of self and you know and and meaning and purpose in the world beyond motherhood. Now and I understand there are so many women who are like, but my but motherhood is my meaning and my place in the world. And that is my job. And I get that. But by the way, it ends. There is a, there's like a, we will always be mothers. But when your kids go off and they start their own life and they're no longer under your care, then who are you? And I know women, you know, a woman's midlife crisis is, is often at that point when the kids are, you know, as have flown the coop and, and moms are like, well, who, who am I now? Yeah. Um, I know my mother-in-law talks about this a lot about her, the depression that she went into very, very dark place when her boys graduated and left. Yes. Um, it's like your purpose is gone. Right. But, right. Right. And now what's and, my purpose? And now what's my purpose? Right. Yes. And, and how many men feel or are taught that fatherhood is their purpose? Listen. Motherhood absolutely is an enormous part of who I am and my life and my my joy. Um, but it's not my purpose, right? It's not and, and I'm not saying I'm not saying that to to be judgmental. I'm really not like I I get it. But I think we also have to look at it in the context of like, did, would a man ever say that? Like, yeah. were you conditioned to to, to believe that. And I know motherhood yeah. is very different from fatherhood, especially if you have biological children and they came out of our bodies and all of that. But we subjugating ourselves um, to uh, the institution of motherhood and marriage can leave us like just devastated uh, yes. financially, um, you know, socioeconomically, all of those things. 
Um, another, one of the other things that Leslie Bennett talks about is how, um, you know, we live longer than men, right? So we have, if we give over all of our financial dependence, like if we are completely financially dependent upon men and then they die, there are more widows than widowers, right? So like, what's the, pl what's the plan <laughs> when you're like 65 and a widow, but you've never worked and your, you know, your, your financial supporter is now gone. Mm, what a point to make. Yeah. And now you're 65 and you're supposed to go out and work and look for a job. So yeah. there's just a lot to consider there, a lot yeah. to consider. And, you know, if I had a, again, like if I had a girl, I would say, what am I modeling? You know, do I, do I want my daughter to be, to aspire to, to be a wife and a mother? Or do I want her, you know, to, to have more than that? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that, um, tell us more, because uh, this is where I, I do want to end with you telling us about, should I stay or should I go? This is your course okay, yeah. that you, it, yeah, got, so it's an online coaching or how does it work? Yeah. Well, there's a couple, I have a couple programs. So the online program, yes, should I stay or should I go is an online self-paced program. You take yourself through it. All of my, um, online programs, all of my programs, um, also have access to a client only Facebook group so that it's really, you know, you can ask questions. I do a monthly community call, which is great for any of anyone who's ever been a client. And that includes people in my online programs. And those community calls are amazing. Um, you know, people bring amazing questions and I just sort of did them as like a, oh, I'll just add that in as well. And they've become like the favorite thing of people in these, pro in these programs. So, um, and so, yeah, so should I stay or should I go is my online program. And I also have a group program that I'm, that I started, um, called grit and grace. And that's for people yes. at any stage of the pro of the game, whether you're trying to decide or you're, you know, um, going through it or you're trying to recover from it. Uh, and that's again, like also just oh, so great. I love it. I love, I was like, I don't know, is this going to work? And they're loving it. They're getting so much out of it. The accountability, the, um, the community aspect, right? Cause women, man, we love a community. Yes, and, <laughs> and, you, and you do talk yeah. about the, the importance. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that is, it's so important to build your community. Yeah, it really like, is. It really no, is. It, it, yeah. Like this is, and that 100%. is, that, that goes, that goes for, um, really just navigating life because oh, I mean, and yes. divorce is so difficult. And I mean, life is just going to always, there's always going to be some sort of huge challenge that we are all facing. But if you mm -hmm. have people around you, like-minded people that you can turn to and just be like, yeah. what, what's going, how do you, and having a coach like yourself yeah. that can help. Um, yeah. I think that it's just so, it's so important. Yeah, it really so. is. And that's, you know, women are all saying like, I just never, I also never knew how much I needed this community. Now that I hear other women's stories, I realize I'm not alone. And like, wow, the power yes. of the power of that is, is, is really immeasurable. Yeah. It's priceless. Well, yeah, I am just so incredibly grateful. Um, for our time together, Kate. Thank and I, I, this is, this has me. been like a packed full of, you know, information <laughs> and guidance I that I think a lot of women, um, and some men will resonate with and learn from. So thank you for all thank your you. time, my dear. And I really Thanks, appreciate Robin. you and all your yeah. work you're doing. <laughs> thank you so much. It's so good to talk to you. Thank you. You too. And we'll see you soon. Okay. Please visit realloveready.com to become a member of our community. Submit your relationship questions for our podcast experts at reallovereadypodcast at gmail.com. We read everything you send. Be sure to rate and review this podcast. Your feedback helps us get you the relationship advice and guidance you need. The Real Love Ready Podcast is recorded and edited by Maya Anstey. Transcriptions by otter.ai and edited by Maya Anstey. We at Real Love Ready acknowledge and express gratitude for the Coast Salish people, the stewards of the land on which we work and play, and encourage everyone listening to take a moment to acknowledge and express gratitude for those that have stewarded and continue to steward the land that you live on as well.